At Say Hi to the Future, we believe exploring and nurturing human ingenuity is a leadership imperative. It must be sought and can be honed in every leader. I'm your host, Saqib Vali, Explorer Say Hi to the Future, the fast-growing community highlighting the human side of ingenuity. Our guest today is Melissa Chi, a visionary tech executive, entrepreneur, and business leader who has created global companies in transformative technologies. Building on a 25-year career scaling global technology multinationals and startups, Melissa most recently was the CEO of Venture Lab, a leading global founder community for hardware and enterprise software companies in Canada. At Venture Lab, she elevated Canada in the global semiconductor industry through initiatives such as Venture Lab's Hardware Catalyst Initiative, Canada's first and only hub for semiconductor hardware, tech companies, and was a founding member of Canada's Semiconductor Council. During Melissa's tenure, the organization was recognized as Canada's most admired corporate culture and thrice as a great place to work for inclusion, technology, and managed by women. A champion of diversity and inclusion and the advancement of women and girls in STEM, Melissa is a respected thought leader at the, at the strategic intersection of critical technology sectors and the imperative for a more inclusive tech ecosystem. Melissa currently serves on the boards of the Vector Institute of Artificial Intelligence and the Asia Pacific Foundation of Canada. She's past board director at NGEN, Canada's global innovation cluster for advanced manufacturing, McKenzie Health Innovation Institute, and Make a Wish Canada's corporate cabinet. Welcome, Melissa, and thank you for taking time out from your ramp back schedule. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really, really, <laughs> we've already had a, a bit of a conversation, but I'm very excited to have our conversation and thrilled to be here. So thank you for inviting me. Melissa, let's let our listeners hear in your voice how you would introduce yourself. I think you had a very comprehensive intro, but if I was to do the elevator pitch, you know, I'm a lifelong enthusiast of deep tech. Uh, champion of inclusion, um, in particular, women and girls, um, not just to pursue careers in STEM, but really to just explore um, the realm of, of STEM and science and, and the importance that it plays in creating really uh, global citizens, right, and really unleash our potential there. Um, and that has been kind of a theme, I think, that we're going to talk about through, through my journey um, in work, life, and play. Um, I am a huge believer in, in bold thinking, um, that we should lead with empathy and that I firmly believe uh, that we have to do what we say. So execute with pragmatism. So that's kind of my, I would say, a summary. You know, moving into semiconductors and, and Saka, maybe we can, you know, I could talk about this topic, as you know, for, <laughs> for hours. So maybe we can have a bit of a, a dialogue um, because I think there, there are certainly a lot of aspects to this and I don't want to bore <laughs> our listeners. Um, but if I take a step back, first of all, to provide context, when we think about what are our iPads, our mobile phones, our med devices, our cars, and even our washing machines have in common, right? They all have chips and semi what we call semiconductors. And those semiconductors, without getting too te technical, are really individual transistors. And they're as small as a nanometer. And for context, a nanometer is 75,000 times smaller than a strand of hair. So just think about a tiny little electronic device that's maybe five by five millimeters in size. And think of the billions of transistors that are on that tiny device. That is the brains of almost every device that we every day in our lives depend on. So that's kind of the demystification, I guess, in terms of what, what, what a chip is. I can certainly, if it's of interest, talk about what our role is um, and, and our contribution for, for Canada, if, if that's a, an area you think is, is good to dive into. What do you think? I, I, I absolutely think, I think it's important. So, so Melissa, I mean, the, especially after um, the introduction of ChatGPT, suddenly I think every child knows where the semiconductor chip is. Um, not that before we didn't, but now it's just so prevalent, the conversations everywhere. Um, and, and, my, and, and the thought, uh, given that you've been at the forefront in Canada, what I'd love to get your take on from a demystification standpoint would be, 
what happened? Like, how come Canada's contribution and role, where, you know, where is it? Are we quite there with where the rest of the world is? Are we, are we punching at our weight, above our weight? Why, why not? I mean, it'd be great to just get your thoughts on it. So I think there's two <clears throat> things. Um, one, I think this new world order, as you said, chat GPT really kind of escalated and accelerated that. But even before that, there was COVID um, and the pandemic. And so mm -hmm. in 2020, what we saw was something that the industry already knew, which is that it's a very cyclical industry. The semiconductor industry is a very highly globally integrated supply chain. And it's also very cyclical, meaning that, you know, you have years that are boom, and then you can have long periods that are bust. And so just taking it a little bit further back, you know, what happened in COVID and, and the pandemic is that you ended up with a supply chain that essentially came to a halt. Um, and so that we saw that in terms of shortages of cars, in terms of shortages of chips and the sensors that were needed for ventilators. And so all of that, because it ended up, at, you know, the crisis, let's call it, ended up really affecting everybody and every you know nobody thought about the electronics in their devices until <laughs> they couldn't get an ipad or until they couldn't buy a car um and and i and i share this because where the world is going you know if you i'm not sure if you've read that book but a lot of people have have noted it is um chip war by chris miller um, and mm -hmm. he wrote and and i'm just reading here that semiconductors are the most critical technology of our time and it is because, as we've discussed, it's so foundational to products, industry, and it's a technology enabler, right, of the most advanced innovations in, in products. And I think, in my opinion, the new world order post chat GDPT is going to be divided into two camps. We're going to have importers of chips who will depend on others, and we're going to have creators, innovators, and manufacturers of chips who are going to secure their own supply chain and their national security. That's what chips have now become. You know, many industry experts have now described them as the new oil. And so, and I, and, and again, I, I know I haven't answered the Canadian question, but I think the, the, some of these statistics are really important to just understand and grasp for the general audience, how big this industry is. It's $7 trillion. It is the most IP intensive sector with every top global patent application is related to semiconductor design or a product that must use chips. And we also know that for every job created in the semiconductor industry, almost six jobs are created across the economy. That's a very large multiplier. So against that backdrop, where does Canada play? So Canada actually has a very long history all the way back to Nortel. Um, and, and for those who, who don't know Nortel, Nortel was a Canadian founded global multinational telecommunications giant for many years, had, had hundred, over a hundred years of history in this country and also made massive contributions into the semiconductor ecosystem, starting kind of centered in Ottawa. And I won't go through a history lesson of what that meant, but Canada through that initial kind of play in the Ottawa region and Toronto region um, really spurred a lot of semiconductor innovation and design, uh, I would say 34 years ago, context wise. And so for Canada, if we look geographically in Quebec, we have Bromont and Albany. We have that corridor um, that is certainly anchored on IBM and Teledyne, um, but also has great institutions like C2MI. But what you have in Ontario, is a critical mass of semiconductor design. And that is key because that's where a lot of the IP is created, right? And, and so you've got this really robust ecosystem, both in terms of startups and scale-ups and, and global multinationals who are choosing Ontario to really scale. But you also have a venture capital, very deep venture capital system that allows that domestic ecosystem to, to grow. And then you actually have an emerging sector in British Columbia, and you have an emerging sector in Alberta with nanotechnologies. So we actually have a pan-Canadian ecosystem. What I will say is that Canada is a very favorable environment to lead, but we probably haven't taken the steps we need to. 
Um, so we have all the ingredients from manufacturing capacity to design expertise, to a legacy of being able to thrive in this sector, to very favorable trade relations with major international players, which as I said at the outset, th this is a geopolitical mm -hmm. game now. The question <laughs> I think that we have to ask ourselves as Canadians is, are we going to be bold enough to invest, you know, in areas of comparable advantage? And that means we don't necessarily need, you know, mo there are lots of other regions and you and I have talked about this so many times about Asia, the US, Europe, billions and billions of dollars are being Singapore investing in the sector. Canada does not have that investment capacity, but that doesn't mean we don't ha can't have a role as part of the strategic value chain. So I'll pause there because um, certainly I'm sure that's brought a bunch of other thoughts that I can certainly comment on. No, this is this is extremely helpful. So so is it right for me to say historically we've 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 punched above our weight? Um, we have had a good history of. Uh, not just from a um, design and technology and patent area, but also in manufacturing. We have all the right ingredients. And I guess what I'm hearing now is we have we are at a fork road. Um, uh, you know, we are at a fork in the road where I think it's going to be our decision how we wish to play in it. Um, but this is extremely helpful. This is extremely helpful. So thanks a lot, Melissa. The other piece that Canada really has an important role to play that we often take for granted, frankly, is our inclusive community and our immigration policies. And in the semiconductor sector, where we would have our talent, our workforce, that is actually one of Canada's biggest differentiated assets in the sector. And so I think, I think you summarized it really well, um, but it is, we are at a fork, we're at a crossroads. I think it's Canada's opportunity to dare greatly, but I do think that we need to make bolder decisions and strategic policies and, and choose where we're going to invest. Because I think decisions that are taken now are going to determine whether Canada is going to be part of this modernized future economy, whether we're part of this transformation in terms of what the manufacturing ecosystem looks like. And I also think it's an imperative for Canada because the rest of the world is moving forward and it's going to move forward with or without us at the table. And I think, I, thanks. Thank you very much. I completely agree. I think, I think our inclusive stance um, uh, as borne by immigration and our policies there uh, for sure is a, uh, is a competitive advantage in lots and lots of ways to so completely understand. Um, I think Melissa, this, setup also gets us to a uh, to a certain area that say hi to the future explores on a regular basis right one of the provocations that say hi to the future explores is this notion of resilience um and i think just in terms of how we've spoken about the semiconductor aspect of it is also a way of how we will prove to be resilient to uh, how some of the change that's happening so take us through your personal journey and an example from one of your professional endeavors to weave into it how resilience has played a pivotal role in your life. Journeys are long and winding. <laughs> and every crossroads you get to make a choice. And my particular, from a, from a personal and a career journey, has, has never been linear. And so I'll focus more on, the, on the, the professional one in a moment. But, you know, as background, my... My parents immigrated here from Canada to Canada 50 years ago from Singapore. And it's really through their example that um, framed, I think, how my version of resilience really um, embodied itself and continues to, to um, grow, which is the ability to work hard, the value of learning, and the importance of giving back to my community. And the reason I kind of frame that is because that was the start of my journey. Um, you know, professionally, when I was in high school, <laughs> I think I have shared this story. I was very strong in math and science, um, but physics was actually my weakest science. And I loved music. 
I really loved music. And so I, the reason I take us all the way back there is when I was looking for what to do in um, uh, undergrad, post-secondary, um, I applied to a number of engineering programs, but I did, I was like, I guess many young girls at the time and still today, I was actually told not to go into engineering by my physics teacher. <laughs> and so I think that was probably my first example of resilience where I said, well, <laughs> I'm going anyway. And I did, I, I ended up going to McGill. I was the only actually graduate of my class that year because I went to an all girls school um, who ended up in an engineering program. Um, and I pursued computer engineering at McGill. And McGill was a fantastic opportunity for me uh, to explore other extracurriculars in terms of giving back to the community, in terms of finding my voice. I was always a very shy, shy child and I didn't like public speaking, but through um, my experiences at McGill, I was on student council for the Electrical Engineering Society. I ran one of the student um, enterprises, which was actually scooping ice cream. <laughs> so I, I kind of found my love for entrepreneurship and business. And I actually shouldn't admit this, but I wasn't really strong academically in my engineering courses. And so where I found my groove was actually taking a lot of my academic um, classes through uh, and, and electives through the business school. So when I graduated, I, I knew I wasn't going to be a traditional technical engineer um, because I just liked to, talk to people. I liked solving, I liked the part of engineering where we solve problems, but I enjoyed the people aspect and the business aspect, right? How do you commercialize? So I joined Nortel and we've already talked about Nortel, um, but it was at the height of the boom and it was a great place to start, learn, but that was probably, so you can see the resilience theme kind of, right? Struggled a little bit in academia, ended up at a big multinational, Canadian one, which was fantastic. Um, but that multinational, <laughs> I was only there for like a year and a half. And then it, it was the year 2000. And most of us know what happened in 2000. And Nortel obviously went through a serious decline and, and eventually folded in 2006 or somewhere around there. But I had the most amazing opportunities there because of the culture that they fostered for creativity and innovation. And so I got a lot of international experience. I really had the opportunity to learn a lot of product management and business and marketing opportunities. Um, and so I was doing my MBA part time at U of T. And when I graduated, I decided I either want to go into a venture capital or I'm going to join a startup. So a semiconductor startup came along. And as we all know, a journey in any sort of startup is one full of resilience just because of you have to roll up your sleeves and do what you need to do to make the business successful. Um, and so I joined a semiconductor startup. Um, you know, the first kind of half of my career there, we were scaling small little chips that uh, ended up uh, selling into LG and Panasonic and big multinational consumer brands. Um, and that was a fantastic, I, I was the country manager, I eventually became the country manager for Asia. Um, and then we recapitalized, we listed as a public company to, to raise capital um, and emerged as a, a merged company. And then we kind of transitioned into more consumer electronics and, and cables and selling to Oculus, which obviously is now Facebook. And so, you know, that in itself, I think was learning in the face of adversity, because startups face lots of different challenges, whether it's capital, whether it's making sure that we have the right people, right? But in, in a context where larger midsize or, or big multinationals, you just don't have um, the type of safety nets. <clears throat> and then my last kind of hop was really to go to uh, experience a midsize company. Um, and I found that I was still being pulled back to the, the semiconductor ecosystem, uh, sorry, the startup ecosystem. And that's where I ended up at Venture Lab. Every time that you and I have had a conversation, I, I just get another nugget that's in there. <laughs> um, uh, so, so Melissa, you, you said something about at Nortel, they fostered a culture of innovation, right? Um, and creativity. So uh, what, I'd, what I'd love to get um, your take on, uh, your leadership take on is ingenuity and more importantly, the human side of ingenuity as it relates to you and your organization's success. 
uh, what's your take? When has it worked well? When has it not? What have you learned along the way? So in my experience, I'm going to, I've always been taught threes. <laughs> Ingenuity, I think, is one part innovation, one part integrity, one part inclusivity. And so what I mean by that is, and I like this quote from Steve Jobs, so if it looks like I'm reading, I am, because I want to get it right. Innovation is saying no to a thousand things. And I think, you know, that piece couldn't be more true for any organization, any size, right? When you're a startup, you're consulting, mid-size, big global multinational, because the ability to think creatively is not about size, it's about approach. It's embedded into the, the organization's DNA, right? The insight, the culture, and embracing that mindset where your team is not afraid to make mistakes, that they're not gonna be fearful that, oh, you know, we can't pivot, that it's a sunk cost. You know, that you can fail fast and really cultivate an, or, you know, an environment of learning and grow at a pace and persevere through adversity. And, and, and ultimately that those failures or those mistakes and, and that learning culture allows you to make better decisions every time. The second piece is inclusivity. And I like to call it inclusivity by design in terms of organizations. And I think it relates to ingenuity because ingenuity is all about humans and humans are all about, you know, do you feel like you're in a safe place in a place where you belong? Um, so whether the company's government or academia or not-for-profit or for-profit, you know, there definitely is a lot of data, and, and we can talk about this later, about that demonstrates the case that diverse and inclusive teams outperform those that are not. That, that, that's, that's very rooted in science and data. And then the third is an integrity. And again, I'm reading, but this is my, one of my favorite quotes from Maya Angelou, which is, I've learned that people will forget what you said, people will forget what you did but people never forget how you made them feel. How you made them feel, yeah. Right? And so what I wanted to share is actually, is, <clears throat> you know, when I was CEO at Venture Lab, which is a leading global founding founder community um, and really gained its um, focus in the hardware and semiconductor space um, during my tenure there, you know, I would often share what the, my team at the time would call Melissa's words of wisdom. And I honestly, I think you know me well enough. I'm a pretty humble person. I don't feel I'm wise, but that's what they called them. And so I thought I might share them here, if that's okay. Um, yeah, the top please. five were, because I think it goes back to the human side of ingenuity. Act with integrity, respect, courage, and confidence, but particularly when no one is looking. Mm -hmm. That means making the right choice, not the easy one. Never under deliver. Number three, always ask why, right? Why am I doing this? You, you might have a list of 30 things, but why are you actually doing those 30 things? Choose your time and talent wisely because those are your most valuable tools. And be a bucket filler, not a bucket emptier and surround yourself with the same. So to me, those are some of my thoughts around what I think are the three kind of subsets of what forms ingenuity. And the human beautifully side. explained beautifully explained <laughs> and you know it's it's funny um it's not a surprise while we were at the kennedy space center there is the whole uh, the the speech from uh jfk gets played time and time and time <laughs> again on the moonshot right um yeah. and when he stood up and and he made the bet when they had not even put a man in space he made the bet that we will put a man on the moon and and what he said there was, uh, we are making this choice not because it's easy. We're making this choice because it is hard. Yeah. Um, and and that goes that goes to show um, the courage. And and I think that's some of the stuff that we as Canadians need to do, even around semiconductors right now. I'm just bringing it back to our original conversation, which is, let's not make the choice because it's easy. Let's make it because it's a hard one. And back to it. Um, you said about integrity exactly the same way. So, so great. I think this kind of also steers us, steers us into our conversation on leadership. And, and I think a lot more on your venture lab experience can come into this. Um, talk to us about leadership. What do you look for, groom for, and nurture in the people you hire or advise management of the boards you serve on? Yeah, so my... Maybe I can couch my leadership approach is all, still a learning journey, but it has been for me 
been driven by this kind of innate passion to make a difference and a sustainable lasting impact. Um, and, and, and always, as you said, as we've discussed in the outset, you know, at the intersection of deep tech inclusivity and underrepresented communities and sustainability, right? Those are the, those are kind of the ingredients for me. And the reason I share this is because there are kind of three areas that are very important for me when I take on any role. And I think that's important for leaders to consider what is important to them. One for me is impact. Can I make a difference? Am I going to make a lasting difference? Number two is, am I learning? I need to be in an environment where I, I feel that I can learn. And the third is purpose and value. Are my contributions valued? So, so, so with that kind of framework, you know, I think it's really important. And I try to share this with, with peers, with, um, you know, folks who work with me, with people who I'm being mentored by or mentoring. And it took me a long time <laughs> to figure this out. But I think that's part of what leadership is. Leadership is learning and always being open to learning and also being frankly humble enough to know and having the self-awareness of where you may not be so strong because when you know those things then you know how to build the team because you as one individual as a leader and not necessarily CEO anywhere in the organization need to know where you're going to complement because it's a team sport unless you're mm -hmm. an individual consultant right um and so to me the most significant thing that has come to to my mind when you when i've been asked this question before is be very clear about what motivates you and really understand what your role and responsibility is and how the things that motivate you how does that really jive because if you're in a role where you're like I don't really, this doesn't align with my principles. This isn't align, and it doesn't have to be, it's not obviously not the three that some people are motivated by money. Some people are motivated by title. Others are motivated by so many other things that I, I, I mentioned. It doesn't matter what they are. Just be really clear about what they are because when you know that, then you know how to make decisions. You know how to choose roles. You know which companies might be aligned in your core values, right? Um, and so, so these are some of the kind of higher level leadership things. But if I, and, and I think if I look at how I chat with peers, as I said, others who, who, who may be trying to figure out um, is leadership for me. I'm a big believer that leadership can take so many different forms. There's no one size fits all, but I think it comes back to know what your value proposition is. And that sounds very producty, you know, but at the end of the day, that starts with figuring out what motivates you. And it's, to me, I've always been a values-based leader. So I find it very difficult to be in an organization from a work perspective, if it is in conflict with my personal values. And that just, that is not necessarily all leaders. Others are able to compartmentalize those things. And, and, and I, but, but for me, they have to be in sync. Otherwise I don't feel like I can be my best version and contribute to the organization in the best way possible. But I think it is about your personal value proposition and figuring out what your North star is, right. Mm -hmm. In all these aspects, right. Like just, it's not a little, we talked about journeys. It's not linear of there's work, then there's life and then there's play. They do overlap, right? Yep. And I'm not saying that you should be checking your, I'm not, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kind of the higher level. How does that all go together? Um, the third piece I'll mention, Zakib, is I found that figuring out who's on your success team is really important. And what I mean by that is it doesn't matter what stage you are in your career or your, your professional journey, but who at that time can give you unbiased advice, who would is in your corner and it's mm -hmm. interesting i found is as i've moved let's call it more senior roles and i and you're the eternal optimist <laughs> and i'm actually the eternal i'm a pragmatic pragmatist possibly <laughs> um and and you know i always strive to have more optimism 
But I you have to know that sometimes people who are working with you often may have their own unconscious biases. And so you have to be really careful about who is on your success team. It could be a mentor, it could be someone that knew you from long ago, it could be a mentee, it could be somebody in your family, right? And, and so I think six, figuring out who your success team is really important as well. Um, well, so one, I think you, you, you don't give yourself enough credit on how much of an optimist you are. Otherwise, you wouldn't be where you are. Um, and <laughs> just, just to give you a compliment, which is, Melissa, you are on my success team. Uh, and you know that because we've, we've spoken about very close things about where we both need to be and, and how we're going to get there. So, um, so thank you for being on my success team. Well, thank you. Um, <laughs> Melissa, so you've had and continue to have a remarkable career journey. Um, and we all wear many hats and roles in lives. Like you've said, you know, there's work, there's life, and there's uh, play, right? So what would be one piece of advice you'd like to share for our listeners? Um, what continues to inspire you irrespective of what role you're playing? You know, frankly, I continue to be inspired by people in our community. Um, but also on the global stage, people who walk the talk and tenaciously pursue meaningful impact and change. And I know that sounds very cursory, but those are the things, those stories. And so I've seen amazing examples in my local community from youth, right? Just young people, unencumbered, pursuing things that really make a difference, not just in the local community, but over time, they're building the resilience and the types of skills that they're going to need for life. And, and to me, that, you know, seeing young people do that um, is, is really inspiring. I think the other piece is uh, there are two kind of, I would say, people that I and they're, they're global icons. People, people know who they are. Um, one is Melinda Gates French and the other one is uh, Jacinda Arden. And both of them in their own rights have been tremendous trailblazers in, in advocating for gender equality. Um, and I, I think those things for me are, are really important. Um, I think it's important that, you know, I'll read a quote for, from Melinda French Gates, which she said, diversity is the best way to defend equality. And if people from diverse groups are not making those decisions, the burdens and benefits of society will be divided unequally and unfairly with the people writing the rules, ensuring themselves a greater share of the benefits and a lesser share of the burdens of the society. If you're not brought in, you get sold out. And so mm. to me, you know, they're well known for, for their work, but I love kind of, I actually personally was very inspired by Jacinda Arden um, through her tenure as prime minister of New Zealand but frankly, even more so when last year she decided to step down as prime minister. And That's now right. Very That's well right. publicized. Um, you know, there's so much discussion <clears throat> about was she burnt out? Was she not? And frankly, I experienced that when I, there was a lot of rumblings, you know, the truth is she was at the top of her game. She knew what she had, cre she had created and delivered. And she knew that it was time for another leader to come in. And to me, that, that really resonated when I made the, the same, same similar decision to, to step down as CEO of Venture Lab, right? Um, and what Melinda French Gates is doing with, with uh, Pivotal Ventures, you know, she's really structured that organization really um, strategically where there's a capital piece, there's a direct, you know, as a limited partner, she's got a piece where um, she's actually investing directly with um, women-led companies, right? So she's not a limited partner at arm's length. She's actually putting money into these female-led companies. And the third piece is philanthropy so that she can do advocacy, right? Mm -hmm. I haven't, that to me is a really smart structure where you, you've got both the profit and the not-for-profit. And, 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 and I think she's making a big difference. So, so to me, it's, it's those pieces. And if I was to, you know, leave, let's say one piece of advice, um, would be what we talked about earlier, which is, you know, as leaders, I think the singular most important thing is to lead, walk the talk, right? And make sure that, you know, if you have a set of core values, make sure you're holding yourself as the leader accountable 
and admit to when you make mistakes, be accountable, but also in terms of your own personal and professional journey, really understand what motivates you and know what your, your personal value proposition, because I think those are kind of beacons that help to guide any leader at any stage in, in terms of um, um, where they're going um, in that next chapter. But for me, that those have kind of been the things that the hallmarks of kind of how I've <laughs> navigated my journey this far. Very cool. And so you said you stepped down from uh, at the height uh, after having created exactly what you wanted to create at Venture Labs. Uh, you stepped down the CEO. I have gotten to know you sufficiently well that you are not going to sit still. So how about giving us a sneak peek into your next chapter uh, that you're busy writing, Melissa? We've known each other since I became a first time CEO. That's actually how we met. And so it's a real yeah. treat to be kind of full circle to be in this next chapter. Right? <laughs> like, no, seriously. And if, if I could take it one step back and then I'll, and then it, because it'll inform kind of what I'm doing. You know, the thing I was most proud of when I was at Venture Lab as a first time CEO is the culture. And lots of CEOs talk about the culture, but it was because we had talked. When I joined and I decided, you know, I was appointed CEO, I wanted to create an organization where when people left, they would continue to be ambassadors of the organization. And that, you know, they, the culture became the behavior. And so we implemented lots of different things kind of systematically to tie behavior with results. And the results kind of spoke for themselves, right? The, the tenure that I had at Venture Lab, um, you shared some of the accolades at the outset, but from a business perspective, it was the highest revenue. Our portfolio was the most successful in terms of IP, in terms of capital that our founders raised, um, in terms of the revenue that they generated and the jobs that they created. And on the business side, it was our highest level of revenue. MPS scores were um, at the top of their game. And so it was an example of when you mesh culture, particularly rooted with an inclusive mindset and action plan, business results come to life. So with that, mm -hmm. looking forward, you know, I'm really excited about embracing opportunities, um, particularly at the board level, um, but looking for, you know, looking for organizations and wanting to connect with organizations where it's at the intersection of deep tech, which I'm obviously very passionate about, um, advancing women and girls in STEM and inclusivity, right? Those are kind of the, the pieces that I'm looking at in the next chapter. And so, you know, there are a few boards that I, I have joined uh, since I stepped down and, and I continue to, you know, look for those exciting opportunities where I, I hope that I can make a difference. And I hope that, you know, the organizations that I am a part of, you know, we're thinking boldly, we're making big, bold decisions, but also with a backdrop of how do we make sure that everybody comes along for the ride? Right, that it's not just one segment of the population, and that we're really making a sustainable impact that uh, that will be beneficial for everybody. Understood. Who should be who should we be in front of, uh, or get the ear of, if we want to be at the forefront of, um, and be bold in this um, in this in this journey on semiconductors that's that's happening right now? Um, who in Canada? Do we need to get the to be on our side to be on on our success team? I think it requires a few things. You know, there there are industry led groups. Full disclosure, obviously, I'm part of one of them, the Canadian Semiconductor Council. But I really think at a higher level, it requires our government to be clear on the priority of the semiconductor sector relative to the other priorities um, in technology, particularly in the artificial intelligence and quantum computing space. Because those are the two, two areas that uh, Canada has really invested you know, in a significant level. The reality is that semiconductors underlies- Both of those. Technologies. Yeah. And so without the stickiness around where is Canada's industrial policy? Other nations don't really know where we stand. So I think part of mm. it is government. 
The second part is making sure that we continue to foster a domestic community that builds new companies. That is really important, right? We have some of the best leading AI semiconductor companies um, in, in, in Canada and other chip companies that are doing very, um, or chip related, I should say, very inventive and innovative um, products and processes on the material side, on the manufacturing side. So I think one of it is, is really making sure that we foster the, the domestic ecosystem. And the third is, again, goes back to industry, big industry, but it's tied to government, meaning we need to make it an attractive place for global companies to want to continue to invest in Canada mm -hmm. in the sector. So it's an industry, government, and ecosystem kind of play. And I think, you know, the challenge that challenge and the opportunity that Canada has is that we are fiscally constrained. We are in a different economic environment, but this is a long investment cycle, meaning it's long term. And we know what happened when we pulled back maybe 10, 15 years ago, um, when we stopped investing in pharmaceuticals, we saw exactly what happened uh, when the, vac the, the early days of the vaccine shortages. This mm -hmm. is no different. This is a, we had a lead, we have the ingredients, but I think it's gonna require um, loud industry voices and really strong industrial policies that attract investment, but also retain and attract talent, the workforce that's gonna be required to retain. So, but I do think it's Canada's opportunity. I do. And I have said that for seven years now, before there was a chip shortage, before any of this happened, I believe deeply that Canada has the capacity to lead and become a strategic value part of this ecosystem. But we need to put money where our mouth is and we need to be bold in stating to the world that this is actually a strategic priority. So yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's great. <laughs> and and you know what? The 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 place where I'll conclude this is um in the end, we are all people, and it's all about humanity. Um, I think that's a that's a great message to have. Thank you so much, Melissa. It was great spending this time with you. Our listeners are in for a treat when they listen to this. Uh, we will tag you and the companies you are on the boards and serve um, in our show notes. Uh, but this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It was a real treat this morning. 